Thank you very much. Um, so one of the biggest challenges we face in the land surface modeling community is being able to get the land carbon sink right. Um, Fung already touched on this, especially the distribution globally. And we really want to know how it evolves. And if we can't simulate it correctly now, we don't really have much hope for our future projections. Um, and one of the ways we can correct it is through data simulation. Um, and a lot of the time we use what we call a steady state relaxation parameter. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about why we use it, um, but also the pitfalls and challenges we have using it. So land surface models have been increasing complexity over the last decades. Um, and even though we have a lot of new processes, there's a lot of things that we do not, we still know that we're not able to model properly, um, including fires, uh, CO2 fertilization, um, and land use change. And so we could argue that actually our best bet in getting the right carbon sink is actually to use data simulation to do this. So um, I'm presenting work that I did during my time at LSE in France using the ORCIDAS model, um, uh, ORCIDAS system, which uh, simulates parameters of the ORCID land service model. Um, LOD briefly introduced the system earlier. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, it is a parameter estimation system. So we're looking at improving the internal parameters of the model so that then we can better match our model output to some observed data. Um, and we do this using a cost function. And then we have different ways for minimizing this cost function. So it already talked about gradient, um, genetic algorithm. And we're going to be using gradient-based descent method in this talk. Um, at LSE using Orchidas, we have over 15 years of experience doing carbon based simulation. And this uh, steady state relaxation factor is something that we've been using throughout our 15 years. Um, but it's kind of hidden away in a lot of our papers, in the discussion, in the conclusions. And so this felt like a good opportunity to really talk about it in the kind of technical challenge, because this is what this conference is looking at, like proper technical challenges we have when we do these kind of simulations. So the problem really boils down to the fact that the spin-up is too costly to be able to use in our data simulation experiments. Um, and when I talk about spin-up, it actually falls into two categories. The, the spin-up is the fact where we run the model so that our carbon pools get to equilibrium. And this is usually followed by a transient run, where we then increase atmospheric CO2 to kind of mimic climate change to then get to the beginning of our simulation. But this takes thousands of years to run um, and well we have to run thousand years of simulation to do it so it takes a very long time computationally and when we do our calibration most of the time it's not feasible to include it so what are the solutions well we can either ignore the spin up um, and that means that we think that what we're the parameters that we're optimizing only impact the short-term processes um, and the long-term processes will not have any impact on these short-term dynamics and this is actually done a lot, but we know it to be wrong. Or the other thing we can do is use uh, a steady state parameter. Uh, in our literature, we call it K-soil C, because we're multiplying the carbon pools. Um, but it has different names in the literature, um, and it is widely used as well. So the problem is, if we don't use a parameter like this, then it's the other parameters that become biased. So here, I've just done a quick experiment over one FluxNet site. Um, where in purple is when we have this case soil parameter absorbing our initial condition or our initial carbon. And blue is when we have it without. And we can see that when we have without, the parameters change a lot more and some of them start hitting our bounds of reality. So we're starting to escape what is actually feasible. So here we can see specific leaf area is beyond the range that we think is acceptable to the model. Q10 is also a respiration parameter. We're starting to reach the bounds. So if we don't use it, then it's the other parameters that become biased. However, it's a very sensitive parameter. And this is work done by uh, Cédric Bacour, where he did the global simulation, looking at optimizing loads of different data streams. And I just wanted to highlight these two runs um, where it was optimizing FluxNet, NDVI, and atmospheric CEO2 data. And the orange is when it's all optimized at the same time. And brown is when it's done in two steps. The first step where it was um, specifically optimizing this case soil parameter. 
And the second step was then optimizing the rest of the parameters. And we can see just by doing these two slightly different configurations. So the global um, carbon sink is relatively similar, but then the partition between the northern hemisphere and the tropics is very different. So although we need this parameter to correct for the initial carbon contents, we get very different results on how we calibrate it. So it's, it's very sensitive and we need to be very careful how we use it. The other problem is what do we then do with the parameters we find with this case soil parameter? Because it's meant to be including a lot of the data about the land use change, the history, the transient run. Um, but if we don't use it, then we get very different results. So these are all the small bars that we have on the left compared to when we do use it, which are these very large bars on the right. And it speaks more broadly to the thing we have in parameter estimation is that none of the parameters really exist in isolation. When you do a parameter estimation experiment, the parameters you're going to find exist in a space constrained with all of those parameters. There's going to be loads of correlations between different parameters. And if we start to just try and use one without all the others, then we're not going to get as good as fit um, and we'll be neglecting a lot of the information. So this is the same if we try and remove cash or C, we're actually taking away a lot of the information that has been imparted on that parameter and the other parameters probably will not work as well. <coughs> this has changed track a little bit, but We've also now started using the nitrogen cycle in our optimizations. And this actually complex, um, makes things a lot more complicated. On the left is quite an old study by Sivan Kipel uh, in 2015. Um, and we can see uh, on the left, we've got GPP. And then on the right, we've got respiration. I apologize that the color scales are not the same, but they're very, <laughs> they're 10 years apart nearly. Um, but what I wanted to show is that the prior in the Cupel study in green, especially for respiration was overestimating. And by doing our optimization using this case or parameter, we were able to match the observations which are in black. However, when we look at Ocidir, which has the nitrogen cycle, we're actually no longer able to fix this overestimation, which normally is fixed with this case or parameter. Instead, the case or parameter goes into fixing GPP. And seeing as they're going in opposite directions, then we're not able to actually do respiration. But we're thinking this is a bit weird because we know that these, it's changing the initial carbon pool, so it should really only have an effect on the respiration, not on GPP. But the problem is when you add the nitrogen cycle, because you now have, we now also need to multiply the nitrogen pools to make sure that we still have the same CN ratio. And as such, we're now going to be affecting the mineralization of the soil, which is then going to impact plant uptake, which is then going to impact photosynthesis. So respiration and photosynthesis are no longer independent. And so this case or parameter is going to affect both. And in the case I showed before, in opposite directions, if that is what the observations deem the, um, the best fit. So the next question is, Okay, so moving forward, is, is maybe one parameter enough? Like maybe we need to have a case or parameter for either different pools or for carbon, for nitrogen. And then we're starting to add a lot of multiplicate factors that we don't really understand. And we might be pulling the model in different directions. We could also add one for biomass. Um, and this would help us to scale the above, bi bi above ground biomass at the initial time step. Do we also need one for the atmosphere to kind of see if we create the atmosphere carbon pool, we can then see how the CO2 fertilization effects change with time. I guess ultimately we don't want to have this kind of factor. And if we were able to constrain the carbon trajectories accurately, we would need to, if we could optimize the turnover rates, but we're not there yet. So what else can we do? Well, we can have a better spin up. So if we followed more like a trendy protocol, and actually accounted for land use change and disturbances in our transient run, then we might be less biased when we start our optimizations. The other thing we could do is use emulators. So this would help us do the spin up at a fraction of the cost, and then we would maybe be able to use them in our optimizations. And actually there's been some promising work um, done in also with Ocular, but in a different team, where they've been able to 
emulate the spin up very effectively, getting the computational demands down by nearly 80%. And this is good news because it will really help us doing our optimizations. So the take home message is, it's dangerous to ignore the spin up, but when we do have a, a multiplicative factor to account for the fact that we have a spin up, then the parameters we're gonna find are gonna be very dependent on that parameter. When we add the nitrogen cycle, things get very complicated. Um, and maybe emulators will help us find a better solution in the future. Uh, thank you very much.